Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. You know, Jesus isn't always saying things that are easy to hear, is he? Maybe today, like me, did you have a hard time saying praise to you, O Christ, at the end of our gospel reading? There's some tough things in there that Jesus said to us today, and that's not the only text that does that. There are numerous times where we get to the end of the reading and it's more of a punch to the gut rather than a gift. And unfortunately, well, I guess I should say fortunately, that's part of the way the Word of God works in our hearts. Right? The law manifests itself to call us to account. But it is the sort of reading that you hope isn't the first Sunday that somebody happens to be visiting your congregation. Because it brings up something difficult to talk about. A point of our beliefs that require a difficult sacrifice or don't allow us to escape enduring some sort of conflict we'd rather not be involved in. But like Peter... As fellow followers of Jesus, we're only left with a simple saying when Jesus sort of implies in the text to us, are you going to leave as well? And Peter's response after Jesus said a hard word, a tough teaching was, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We must pray that that is our response in the face of tough teaching teachings of Jesus as well. And today there are two tough teachings in particular. One, the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's not often you hear in scripture the phrases eternal sin and that you won't receive forgiveness. And not just that you won't, but it uses the word never. That's got to give you some chills just reading that in the scriptures. And the second tough teaching is that Jesus radically changes our understanding of family. And not in the most pleasant way. So let's begin by looking at the unforgivable sin. You hear that term, unforgivable sin, and your first response as a faithful believer is, what is it? Because I want to know so that I don't do it. So the unforgivable sin described here in our text is pretty specific. And in the context of our text, you'll see that it isn't something that can be done unconsciously or by accident. So we get at the beginning of our text, we have Jesus' family. They begin and end the text for our gospel reading today. And at the beginning, Jesus is going around and he's teaching and preaching about God as he is called to do. And he's starting to become quite popular, right? It says here that the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. So there's a large crowd of people. And what is his family's response? They think that he's lost his mind. They're concerned for him, but they're concerned that he's going crazy. Which at first we maybe kind of chuckle inwardly at, but think about that for a moment. Imagine your son or daughter becoming some big name spiritual leader with crowds of people milling around after them. And they're saying things like what Jesus says today. All of a sudden, he's out of his mind is not such an unreasonable statement to make from a worldly perspective. But that isn't blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's the next section that specifically Jesus calls out in warning. Even in this text, he's not accusing people of directly breaking the commandment, but warning them so that they wouldn't, because once they do, he tells us there's no turning back. So we get to the scribes, the religious leaders. They came down from Jerusalem, and they were saying something different. They weren't saying that he was a crazy person. They were accusing him of intentional evil. And not just him, but that the spirit within him, 
the Holy Spirit, was an unclean or evil spirit. It said, he is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons he casts out demons. So what in effect are they doing? They are calling the work of God, the salvific work that he's doing in Jesus, as the work of the devil. And implied in that confession is an active resistance to that. Because if he's doing the work of the devil, then it follows logically that that's something that should be stopped and opposed. And then in verse 23, after they say this, it says that Jesus called them to him. So he's calling these people who have accused him of being of the devil and he's speaking directly to them when he gives these parables. And he talks about a kingdom divided against itself, a house divided against itself. And then he says it's true for Satan as well. If he's divided against himself, he's coming to an end. Now he is coming to an end, but for a different reason. But Jesus goes on to tell them in warning Truly, truly, I say to you, that's a textual hint for us to perk our ears up and pay attention. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter, including apparently blaspheming God the Father and God the Son. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Why would Jesus say such a thing? Because he wants to warn these people who are accusing him of having an unclean spirit, of, bla of, of nearly blaspheming against the Holy Spirit and his work. Jesus is saying, take care. You can't take that one back. Why can't you take that one back? Because it, it amounts to the perpetual active rejection of all the efforts that God is undertaking in order to bring you to redemption. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? To give us the Jesus stuff. What is the Jesus stuff? Forgiveness, life, and salvation. For those who think that's of the devil, they reject those gifts. That's a tough thing to hear. A reminder to us, perhaps, to put it simply, that Jesus is not only our Savior, but he's also the Lord of all things. Isn't it easy sometimes to just think of Jesus as our Savior? I know I fall into this all the time. I'm so thankful for the forgiveness and the grace and the love that he shows me that I forget that he's also my Lord, whom I follow and obey, and who has authority over all things. And here in this text, we're reminded of that role of Jesus. But don't be dismayed. It's clear from this text as well and the, the similar texts in the other Gospels that this is not something you can do accidentally or fall into unconsciously. It essentially amounts to a recognition of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit and yet pronouncing it as the work of evil. Not something that can be done on accident. Not something you can fall into unknowingly. And here it's meant to caution us to take great care in opposing God's work in the Holy Spirit in the church and in the world. To take great care before we seek to assert our own understanding of things over and above God's word and the plan of salvation he is carrying out in the church through the Holy Spirit so that we steer clear of this pitfall. So that's tough teaching number one. You had enough yet? Well, too bad, Jesus keeps going. In verse 31, we hop back to Jesus' family. It says, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. 
Have any of you ever heard something like that before? Your mom's looking for you. Your dad's looking for you. Your family is wondering where you're at. My brother and our family, my younger brother, he was the wanderer. He always walked in front of everyone. He was the one that walked on the walls and the little sidewalks when he could have just walked right in the middle. right? And sometimes he got lost. I got lost too. And you hear those phrases, right? Your family's looking for you. Your dad's looking for you. Your mom's looking for you. And what's the normal response to that? When you're a kid, it's like, oh man, okay, I got to get back to my family. Even when you're an adult, that's the natural response. Why? Because pretty much universally, family is recognized as a good, so it's no big deal. And it makes sense that your family is looking for you. And even in even more extreme situations where you're lost, those words are so great to hear. Your family is looking for you. I saw your dad. He's looking for you. Oh, good. But here in our text today, Jesus does not have that response. He doesn't do what we would expect, what would come naturally for us. Instead, he says some troubling things that make us wonder what the role of family plays in God's plan of salvation. Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you, and his response is, who are they? Who are my mother and my brothers, Jesus says. Imagine hearing that from one of your children. Excuse me? I'll show, who you, I'll show you who your mother and your brothers are. Right, is almost the response we expect. But then he goes even further and he looks about all of those people who are sitting around him. And he says to them, here are my mother and my brothers. Which then begs the question from us, well, what does it mean to be family then? Because I thought it was bound by blood and sharing a name and all that stuff. right? That I was born to a mother and a father and I was born into a family, we shared a name, we have the same, you know, the same, uh, we have a lot of genetic similarities and all that good stuff, the biological descendancy. But here, Jesus is saying something different. Now, he's not denying any of those things, but he's making a tough point. He's reminding us of what God's intention for family has been from the very beginning. That doesn't always pan out in our sinful world. See, God's intention for the family is that it's a blessing to you, both to the husband and wife and their relationship, to each other as father and mother, to their children, and children grow up in a protected and safe environment with people who love and care about them in a way that no other human person can. And it's also meant by God to be the place where you learn about Him. Sure, you learn about God here, and you receive his gifts. That's why he instituted the church. But you primarily learn the stuff of your faith at home. We've learned in the church over the last century that that's an inevitable truth, even if we try to change it. It doesn't quite work out to go against the way God designs and intends things to be. So that's God's intention from the family. We have a nice summary of it in Deuteronomy 6. Right, He gives his commandment to his people, and then he instructs them, to teach that to their children and to do it diligently. Right? So what's going on with Jesus' family in the text? Why is Jesus giving them the cold shoulder, as it were? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the text. What are they saying about Jesus and the things he's doing and the things he's saying? They accused him of being a crazy person. They're concerned about him. They're concerned that he's losing his mind. And so Jesus is teaching them and us that he's doing the important stuff of God and that that is a tie that binds deeper than any other. Right? In the Old Testament, we use covenant language right? and to emphasize the depth of that connection of promise, of covenant with one another, the Hebrew word that you use as a verb for covenant is also to cut, to etch. Right? It's a permanent commitment. 
And here Jesus is teaching that that is the depth. That's the deepest relational commitment that you have, even deeper than your biological family. Turn and look around. Look at all the people sitting here. Jesus is teaching you today that they are your family in a very real way. Like, that's where we say brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're not, we're not just paying lip service. We're acknowledging what Jesus is teaching here, that the deep part of what binds us together is Christ. And it's deeper than anything else that we have. And here Jesus demonstrates that because it puts up one of the bonds that, that we on earth think is the most important family. His biological family is trying to get Jesus to stop doing the things that's garnering all this attention. They're concerned that he might be going crazy because he's saying things like this. But instead Jesus responds that his family are those for whoever does the will of God. He is my brother and sister and mother. So we look at that and we wonder, okay, well, what's the will of God? Because I want to be in God's family. And God's will, notice the people he's addressing. They're the people that are gathered around him, the incarnate word of God, and are listening to what he says. Those are the people who he says, here are my mother and my brothers. They are the people that are doing the will of God. They are listening to the Son of God, the Savior he sent into the world. They're listening to God's word. And even the way the scene is set up illustrates the depth of this connection that we have now together in Jesus. Right, The physical setup, his family does not come in to talk to Jesus. They are on the outside and they send someone in to message him and say, come home. And so you have this image of the people that are gathered around Jesus on the inside and his family on the outside. Now we know from the the later scriptures that some of Jesus' family came to faith in him. So obviously this isn't a permanent state. But in this moment... At the choice between what my biological family wants on earth versus what my new family of God is saying and teaching in Jesus, Jesus is making the answer to that question clear. And this really comes up when I teach confirmation, like the seventh commandment is a good example. You shall not steal, right? Or really any commandment is a good example of this. If your parents ask you to break one of those commandments, You're not supposed to listen to them, even though it says in commandment four that you are. And the reason that you don't have to listen to them is because their authority comes from God, and what they're asking you to do is against God. So no longer are they asking from his authority, but their own. And it's the same here. The biological family, the biological earthly family is asking one of its members to sever the deeper connection, our connection with God and his family. And Jesus' answer is no. That's not the way that works. So take a look around the room again. These people are your family. Family in a deeper way than any other on earth. You're bound together in Christ. You share the same spirit. You are called to the same purpose. Maybe taking different vocations to get there. But we are called according to his purpose. And yes, it can be tough at times because that means, and some of you probably have this in your family in one place or another, That your relationship with your earthly family isn't quite as great as it is intended to be. Because they're asking you 
not to believe in God, or they've distanced themselves from you because you're one of those crazy Christians. Do not despair or be dismayed, for that is the correct choice. If you are to choose between clinging to anyone or Christ, the answer is always Christ. And we pray, and we'll pray today in our service, for those in our families, our biological families, who don't believe in Jesus, who seek to get us to not believe in Jesus, or who just refuse to talk about it. Because we, too, want them to be part of God's family. That was his intention for a family from the very beginning. It was meant to be a blessing of protection and teaching of the faith. And so we endeavor to make it so. So what now? In light of these teachings, what do I take away from this? Well, from the first tough teaching of today, the unforgivable sin, we ought to take great care when we are tempted to challenge what God is doing in Jesus. We ought to take great care when we challenge what he's teaching and what he's asking us to do. And we do that by being diligent in our reading of God's word and our study of God's word and being together in worship. I just had a conversation this week with someone who said, I know what you're saying is true, but it's great to be reminded of it. That's part of the blessing of the body of Christ. There are so many things that we know to be true and believe, but in the heat of the moment, forget them. And what a blessing it is to have a brother or sister in Christ there who can remind you of that truth but also to be comforted if you are worried about this unforgivable sin as something that you might have done. The very fact that you ask that question and have shown concern about it means you haven't. It's not something done accidentally or unconsciously. What about the second tough teaching with families? What now? Well, now family looks a bit different to us who follow Christ, doesn't it? It's bigger than it was before. But the unfortunate reality of sin is that our two families don't always get along as God intended them to. Just like in our gospel text. If it happened to Jesus' earthly family, it's going to happen to ours too. But Jesus gives us a clear answer to that dilemma cling to him. And then God will work through that to bless you and your family. And if you don't believe me, just pray for them. And you're already doing the work and blessing of God in that context. Martin Luther understood this very well. At the time when the writings of the church were being written in languages that people who didn't work in the church could finally understand, And faith began to be doled out through God's word. He wrote a small catechism. And you'll notice if you have one at the beginning of every section. He says as the head of the household should teach in a simple way to his children. He understood God's intention for the family and so do we. And today our text reminds us of that intention. To bring us all into the family of God. And our text today tells us which family is the most important. They're in conflict. We are called to choose God's family above all else. It isn't always easy to do so. And you may get the same response that Jesus got from his family. But take heart, for the one you cling to has overcome all things. And the last takeaway I have for you is this, that if our focus is on Christ, if our focus is on God's will, We're in good shape. We're in good shape on both of these things. Because we're not focusing on what we want out of family, not what we want out of our relationship with God, but we're focused on Jesus and what he has come to bring us. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let's do the will of God. Let's gather around our Savior And listen to what he has to say. Let us seek to do his will. Let us pray for open hearts and open ears. 
so that when he speaks his wisdom and offers his guidance, we are open to hearing it. That we look for the true answers he provides and we don't look to ourselves or this world for hope or for wisdom. Have faith in Jesus. He has called you into God's family. You who were once dead in your trespasses and sins are now alive as children of God. How amazing is that? And by the gracious work of the Holy Spirit, you have the Jesus stuff. Forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation in him forever. Hold fast to your Savior Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds so that in times of trial and conflict in your own families, you may cling to Christ and find your hope and solace in him and what he has given you until he comes again to make everything new. Amen.